Good evening, folks, and welcome to what my slide says is week 66 of the Gospel of Luke. I had to start, I'm going to number them going forward because I was getting confused when I was doing the, uh, when I was putting the slides together, uh, uh, losing track of what week is what week. But I'd like to begin this evening with a reading of Psalm 144 a rather ironic uh, psalm to read uh, in light of what we're going to be studying this evening. Psalm 144, blessed be the, the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and, in, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. O Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, his days are like a passing shadow. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from the many waters, from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lies and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-stringed harp I will play to you, who gives victory to kings, who rescues David his servant from the cruel sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lies, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace. May our granaries be full, providing all kinds of produce. May our sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. May our cattle be heavy with young, suffering no mishap or failure in bearing. May there be no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people to whom such blessings fall. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Last time we were together, uh, we were in Luke chapter 20 through the first four verses of Luke chapter 21, looking at the um, final confrontation that Jesus has with the religious leaders of the time, the, the, the San, not the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees come to him with this hypothesis uh, to discredit him as a teacher of of Moses because they expect him to not be able to answer their question about this woman who had seven husbands and in the resurrection to which one of the men is she going to belong as wife in the resurrected life and Jesus responds as you don't understand the resurrection uh, you don't understand the purpose of life in the hereafter life in heaven and the purpose is not propagation it's not marriage and the marriage relationship it's something much much grander than that having answered all of the questions of his detractors and opponents he asks a question in turn whose son is the messiah a question that they are unable to answer the people are he's driving toward a point and the only answer they can give is that if the if david calls the messiah his lord if the father is giving honor to the son, then the son has to be greater than him. So the son has to be something greater than human it is the point that Jesus is getting across here. There is a divine aspect to, to the son of God, to the, to the Messiah, who is the true Messiah, not the Messiah that they're expecting is going to deliver them from under the, under the foot of Rome. In fact, what we're going to look at tonight proves that that's simply not going to happen. And then he ends that section with a teaching of the examples of the scribes who devour widows and then the widow who gave everything that she had and holds her up as the one who um, has given more than these others have because she has given, they've given out of their abundance. She has given out of her poverty, what she doesn't even have, uh, everything that she has to live on. And so this evening, 
rather than finishing out this chapter, uh, chapter 21, like I had initially intended, we're going to look only at verses 5 to 24 this evening, the fall of Jerusalem. There's a lot of material here, and um, I want to go through it a little bit slowly, a little more carefully than I had initially intended. I'm going to read this text for you, and then we'll uh, get into some of the uh, picking it apart a little bit. This is Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 5 through verse 24. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, see that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but, once, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness." Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But... When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So this is really, as, as I mentioned here in this first slide, part of a larger context. This discourse here, the fall of Jerusalem or the end times discourse or whatever you want to call it, is presented in all three synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each have an account of it. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 31, Mark 13, 1 to 27, and here in Luke, uh, beginning in verse 5, going all the way down to verse 38. In all three of these accounts, there is a pattern. Uh, we have Jesus speaking of signs that are going to presage the fall of Jerusalem. Then he warns, or he, rather he gives the disciples instructions um, to pay attention to the lesson from the fig tree. Learn the lesson from the fig tree. And finally, he speaks about the second coming. All three of these accounts follow the same pattern, but there are some minor differences. There's some variance here. Uh, Matthew gives a much longer section devoted to one of the, of the three elements of this that we'll be looking at uh, a little bit more detail next week. And so I want to preface this by saying that what I'm presenting to you tonight is my opinion, okay? In my opinion, this text, the Olivet Discourse, if you want to call it that, even though Jesus is there in Jerusalem as he's giving it here, as Luke records it, is one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament to accurately interpret and understand, 
the reason for that, in my opinion, is because there is a shift. Jesus shifts subjects from the fall of Jerusalem to his eventual return. And finding the point of that shift is a difficult thing to do. Uh, there's no clear consensus among those who studied these passages. I've read, well, I can't tell you how many commentaries and uh, articles and uh, scholarly papers that I've read when teaching Matthew and when teaching Mark. I could tell you how many I've read in, in study of Luke because it was a very finite, small number, uh, but devoted simply to uh, Luke's presentation. And so what I'm giving you is going to be my opinion. I think Jesus is speaking of the fall of Jerusalem, uh, beginning from the time that he speaks in verse 6 down through verse 24. And I see a, an end point there. And then there's a shift that's going to take place that encompasses the learning, the lesson from the fig tree, where Jesus is speaking about something else. For years, I have taught it that the taught that the shift comes later. And so when I approached this text this past week in study, I was approaching it with that same mindset that the shift comes later after the lesson from the fig tree. And the more I worked at it, the more I studied it, the more I prayed about it, the more difficult it became to make that template, if you will, fit. Uh, so I backed away from it and uh, meditated on it, prayed some more. And I think that perhaps in the past where I have shifted it later, I've been incorrect in doing so. Uh, I backed up and I looked at Matthew's account. I looked again at Mark's account. And I'm, I see some consistency with what I'm going to present uh, this week and next week in Luke. Uh, but again, this is my opinion. Uh, there's no consensus on these things. Uh, I have been wrong. I could still be wrong. Uh, so I want you to study this carefully for yourself. I'm going to present to you a lot of material tonight. Uh, I'm going to quote a lot, an awful lot from Josephus tonight, uh, because Josephus was probably the best eyewitness that we have to these events recorded outside of, outside of scripture. So anyway, that's, that's my disclaimer or qualifier, if you will. All three Gospels, the teaching about the uh, fall of Jerusalem starts with a comment about the grandeur of the temple. The disciples pointing out what a magnificent edifice the temple is. Um, no one asks Jesus. When is Jerusalem going to fall? That's not the question that Jesus is answering initially. They ask the question after he makes his comment that not one stone is going to be left standing on another. And then they say, wait, 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 what, what are you talking about? When's this going to happen? No one asks about the, the second coming of Jesus because at this point, they don't understand the nature of the kingdom of God. They don't understand, even though Jesus has been speaking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, they don't fully understand what Jesus means. This, this is all being held from them, from their understanding, until after the resurrection, as we, as we see later on in the Gospel of Luke. So Jesus isn't giving the, this teaching in answer to these two questions. He speaks about the fall of Jerusalem, answering the second question, but his initial remark is based is an answer to the people pointing at the temple and saying, look, see this. It's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It is, it's incredible. This comes on the heels of Jesus having faced the Sanhedrin and the and the chief priests and the scribes and the Jewish leaders who have challenged him on his authority. And Luke is taking a, a, a twin uh, view here. 
to answer the question, does Jesus bear the stamp of divine authority or do the temple lead or does the temple leadership? Jesus has been able to discredit them. They tried to discredit him. Jesus has thwarted their, their efforts in every turn. And so I think we what we're seeing here is certification. Remember chapter one, verse four, that you may have certainty of the things that you have been taught. Certifying that Jesus' authority comes from God. Jesus here gives a prophecy that those who hear simply can't accept. What do you mean the temple is going to be destroyed? Look at the size of this building. It's huge. How could anyone possibly destroy it? Why would anyone possibly want to destroy it? What do you mean it's going to fall? This is God's house. God's not going to let his house fall, forgetting that God let his house fall at the end of the book of Jeremiah, when the, the temple of Solomon was left in ruin. And also here, I think Luke is trying to show in a public forum that the Jerusalem leadership does not have the divine sanction uh, from God anymore. Uh, is that evidenced in their participation in the attempt to discredit God's Messiah? They are stubbornly refusing to accept Jesus for who he claims to be, for who his followers claim that he is. They're saying, no, he can't possibly be a Messiah. He doesn't look like a Messiah. He's not even wearing armor or carrying a sword. What are you talking about? This, 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 this is just ridiculous. And so when we look at this passage here, and start. The temple was a magnificent building. The, this is the second temple. It was initially started, if you remember, in the book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. The foundation of the temple is laid. The walls of Jerusalem are repaired, and the temple begins to be rebuilt. The temple had been rebuilt, but then King Herod, who the Jews or who the New Testament sometimes refers to as Herod the Great. King Herod decided he wanted to expand, greatly expand its size. It was perhaps an attempt on his part to gain favor with the Jewish people who really didn't like him at all, or to, um, you know, leave a, leave a stamp and leave his stamp in history. So in 20 BC, Herod undertook this project of greatly increasing the size and the grandeur of the temple, the second temple that had been built at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, essentially doubling its size. We're told in John chapter 2, verse 20, that the project had been going on for 46 years at the time that Jesus says, if you, do you see this temple? If, I tell you, if you tear it down in three days, I'll rebuild it. And they're saying, it's, it's taken 46 years for this temple to be built. What are you talking about? Jesus isn't referring to the physical temple. He's referring to himself. But the temple was, it was magnificent. Uh, even Roman historians, uh, the Roman historian Tacitus writes in his histories, that the temple was immensely opulent. Josephus gives us an awful lot of information about the temple. Uh, speaking of the stones, the, the stones that the people are, are um, commenting over, saying that the, some, of these, these, some of the surviving foundation stones, if you ever go, uh, and I've never been over to Jerusalem and you see the ruins of the temple, some of them are, they measure 42 feet long, 11 feet high, and 14 feet thick, weighing hundreds and hundreds of tons. Josephus describes the, um, the, 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 the stones that are used, and archaeology has shown that the size of the stones that were used in the construction of the temple are larger than stones used in any other temple structure in the ancient world. It simply was the biggest. I think that was one of Herod's goals. We're going to be, build the biggest temple. Our temple is going to be the biggest because God is the biggest, but Herod wasn't really uh, a devout Jew by any, any uh, estimation. 
Josephus writes about the portico at the south end or the, the royal entry, 45 feet wide with columns that, um, four rows of columns that were 40 feet tall, supporting a cedar paneled ceiling. Each of these columns would take three men, three, three men to stand and put their arms out at, at length as far as they could to, to encircle it. And these columns are decorated with votive gifts given by the Jew, Jews who come on their pilgrimage into Jerusalem. So Bill Moore leaves the, the uh, town of Colony and he goes to Jerusalem as a, as a devout Jew and he brings along some gold ornament or some, some votive gift and it will be hung on these columns. These columns had gold vines wrapped around them going from the floor to the ceiling. And on these vines were hung gifts brought by um, devout Jews Jews who came to worship out of a true and faithful heart or Jews who came out of, hey, I'm going to show you up and bring, bring a bigger gift than, than yours. And the disciples here in verse 5, uh, while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones, there's the big stones and offerings. These are the offerings that are hanging from these columns. Um, that's what Jesus speaks into. The, uh, one of the commentators that I read, uh, Edwards in, in the Pillar Commentary, wrote the, this uh, statement, speaking about the grandeur of the temple. Uh, the temple was an awe-inspiring building. It was the, the, in the center of it where the sanctuary was, Herod had built it up uh, to a height of Oh, goodness, is 100 and, 150 feet, 160 feet. I wrote it down here someplace. It was, it was really, really big. It inspired awe because it was larger than any building that, that existed, um, any, build, any temple building that existed. And so Edwards writes, how different was the impact of such grandeur on Jesus? As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. For what, what for worshipers and visitors was sacred astonishment was for Jesus a premonition of disaster. His response was a sobering reminder of the divine perspective and judgment on human culture. The time will come as a reference to God's final decisive intervention. Like a once healthy system of cells that have become, has become malignant, the temple has forsaken its intended purpose. Jesus warned in the parable of the fig tree that if the tree does not bear fruit, it will be cut down. Uh, chapter 13, verse 8. The fig tree, a symbol of the temple, will be destroyed stone by stone. Look for a second at Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 and 17. Jesus um, woes against the Pharisees and the, and the uh, Sadducees and the scribes. <clears throat> says in verses 16 and 17, woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? There was their focus, the opulence, the grandeur, the our church building is more decorated than your church building. We have, you know, finer furnishings for you to come and worship God in. And the temple almost becomes an idol in and of itself. The people are more in awe of the building than in the God that the building is dedicated to. And you see this in uh, medieval times and, and even uh, more recent history, the grand edifices of these cathedrals that were built uh, that 
were buildings initially dedicated and devoted to God, but they became they became idols to themselves. They became objects of worship to themselves with people building them up and making them grander and fancier and forgetting that for 40 years in the desert, God lived in a tent. He doesn't need a fancy building. Uh, Christy writes St. Peter's Basilica. Yeah, that's a good example. These immense, opulent, over-the-top buildings, these houses of worship that have everything you can imagine except God. They don't have hearts dedicated and devoted in obedience to God. And, and I, yes, I'm painting with an extremely broad brush, okay? I'm not trying to sully everybody and say that everyone is that way. That's the setting that Jesus is speaking into. Josephus writes 40 years after Jesus speaks the words, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another will, that will not be thrown down. Flavius Josephus, I've already mentioned uh, as a Jewish historian, understand that he is writing from the perspective of after the, after the war, after the destruction of Jerusalem, he's writing from the perspective of, it wasn't our fault. It really wasn't our fault. You Romans overreacted to a few bad Jews. It's their fault. The, the, the zealots, they're the ones who did all of this, who, who brought all of this on us, were really the victims here. Josephus, who's... Um, patron is Emperor Vespasian, Vespasian in the capture of the city to the south of Jerusalem, the name of which escapes me, uh, when, when it was sacked, uh, Lakish, when it was sacked and Vespasian captured the city, um, he captured Josephus and was so taken with him because he was a learned man and a scholar and could interpret and, and you know, serve as a translator, he took him on as his own personal scribe. And so Josephus became scribe to the emperor and wrote the Antiquities of the Jews, long, lengthy tome detailing the Jewish history. And then he wrote a smaller uh, tome called The Jewish Wars. And it's interesting how in all of the Jewish wars, the Jews are the victims. It's never their fault. Uh, people were beating up on us. And if it was our fault, it was because of a few bad eggs. Okay. It was, it wasn't the, the general Jewish population in general. It was just a few uh, instigators, a few uh, ne'er-do-wells who brought all of this down on us. So he's writing from that perspective, but he's also the most recent witness to these events. And so if you want to really, if you want to read uh, in the Jewish wars, you want to read about the fall of Jerusalem. He gives an extremely detailed account of what took place, perhaps exaggerated. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But <clears throat> he, he writes um, in Jewish wars, chapter seven, that Caesar ordered the whole city and the temple to be raised to the ground. All the rest of the wall encompassing the city was so completely leveled to the ground as to leave future visitors to the spot, no ground for believing it had ever been inhabited. So Josephus is essentially saying the Romans tore it down stone by stone, leaving no, stand, no stone standing on top of another, which is exactly what Jesus says here. Josephus is not a believer. Okay, he's not a Christian. He's a Jew. Uh, he's a certain... Jewish survivor of the war you know, by his own uh, by his own cleverness and his own cunning. So the people ask, when is this going to happen? When is this when is this going to take place? And Jesus does not say in about forty years. Instead, he says, "See to it that you are not led astray." Huh? 
How is that an answer to when is Jerusalem going to be left with no stone standing on top of one another? Jesus is answering the question, but he's answering it in a, in a roundabout manner. When he says, see that you are not led astray. There's a twofold answer here. Don't be led astray by humans. Don't be led astray by catastrophe or disasters. Um, don't be led astray by humans. It's amazing how the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70 parallels the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC when Nebuchadnezzar brought his army in and, and leveled the city of Jerusalem and burned the temple to the ground. In the time of Jeremiah, we have, uh, look at Jeremiah chapter 28, uh, just one of the examples that Jeremiah gives us. In Jeremiah chapter 28, beginning in verse 1, if I could find it. I'm in Jeremiah, I just can't find chapter 28. Chapter 28, in verse 1, at the same, in, the, in that same year, the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of all the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And you can go down and read the next, uh, down through verse 17. Hananiah is a false prophet. Nebuchadnezzar has already taken, he's taken away the vessels of the temple, as he mentions here. He's taken people into exile. There are two exiles uh, that, that Nebuchadnezzar takes people back to Babylon. First, he takes away a lot of the artisans. Then he takes away people of influence and the rich people, leaving uh, only the poor in the city. And then when he comes back this third time, Hananiah is saying, he's not coming back. Two years. He's, everybody's coming back. The, the, the gold, the silver, the, the, the king who's been exiled. And Jeremiah says, may it be. But it's not going to happen that way. And so when the Roman army comes against Jerusalem, it's no surprise that other people stand up and say, I got a message from God. We're going to stand. By golly, God's going to defeat Rome. In fact, he's chosen me to lead the charge. And I'll hand every one of you a sword and we're going to run out there and just rout the Romans. Who's with me? And so you get a few Jews who rise up and say, sounds great. We'll go. And they go out and they get slaughtered. In Acts chapter 5, verse 36, Gamaliel, speaking to the leaders of the Jews after the disciples have been uh, arrested for preaching the name of Jesus, says you know, he has them put outside and he, he reminds people of history. A while back, a man named Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody. Those are the key words right there. Jesus says here in Luke, uh, in verse 8, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, claiming to be Messiah. I am he. God has selected me. We're going to go out and we're going to really womp up on the Romans. It stirs up nationalistic fervor. In Acts chapter 21, verse 38, um, there's mention of an Egyptian who led 4,000 men. Josephus says he led 30,000 men in an attempt to storm Jerusalem. 
uh, from the Mount of Olives around AD 55-ish, somewhere in there. Theodos who rose up was around AD 44 to AD 46. Those are two examples. So it's no surprise as Rome finally comes in and the Jews are up in arms that somebody or several somebodies are going to say, God has picked me. I have a message from God. We're going to go out and we're going to rout the Romans. And Jesus is saying, don't be led astray by this. Don't listen to them. Because God has said Jerusalem is going to fall. They're, the time of the Jews is at hand. Uh, Josephus, in describing these individuals, calls them imposters, magicians, and deceivers who gathered followers under the belief that God would give them deliverance. These are men who are stepping out of misguided faith uh, or who are in arrogance, taking it upon themselves to become the instruments of God's deliverance. How many prophets do you read of in the Old Testament who were there, who took the mantle of prophecy upon themselves, who chose themselves to be prophets? Jeremiah didn't choose himself. Jonah certainly didn't choose himself. Isaiah doesn't choose himself. None of the prophets. How many of the followers of Jesus chose themselves to be followers of Jesus, of the original 12? No, Jesus chose them. Jesus chose them all. And sent them out to do his work, um, it's very interesting when you compare these individuals who are taking it upon themselves, these who uh, come in his name and say, we're going to go sock Rome in the mouth and really bloody their nose and drive them off. Those who genuinely come in his name well, let me, before I make this statement here, say, <laughs> Peter, put away your sword. Yes. And we're going to get to that. Um, if, if Bill Moore tells me that he comes to me in the name of Jesus, how am I to know that? How am I to know that Bill genuinely comes in the name of Jesus? John tells us, test the spirits in John in 1 John chapter 3. Those who genuinely come in his name are going to comport themselves as Jesus did, welcoming children uh, and outsiders uh, att and attracting persecution as Jesus attracts persecution. Those who come in the name of Jesus don't make extravagant claims about themselves. I have never once heard Bill Moore say, God appointed me to be an elder and I'm going to be super elder and, and, and I'm going to straighten out all the problems. He doesn't make, he's not making grandiose statements about himself. If anything, I hear Bill speak of his shortcomings. And I think that's true of most people that we, we, understand our position when compared with God, our limitations versus his limitlessness. We don't appoint ourselves to um, positions of, of presuming to say that God has revealed to me such and so a thing that's going to happen. Uh, Christy writes, usually you can sense a, relux a reluctance in what they are called to do. Yes, because they didn't choose it for themselves. Um, when God, when Jesus says, if anyone's going to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. How many of you are eager to sign up for that? Not a lot of people. Um, and yet, here we are. Each of us taking up our cross. Each of us doing our best to die to self, to live to Christ. 
Good grief, how is it quarter of nine? Everywhere I, and anywhere I teach, time goes faster. It, it's, I, I don't understand, it's just not fair. Moreover, um, people who come after Jesus genuinely proclaim a message of repentance and forgiveness rather than a message about the timing of the return. If somebody is proclaiming the time of the return of Jesus, and we'll talk about this more next week when we talk about the second coming, assuming we get that far tonight. So many people have predicted when Jesus is coming back, and every single one of them has been wrong. I always say, if you're speaking to someone who has a different theology than yours, and the basis for their theology is the book of Revelation, and that's the only book they're going to and the only book they're citing, view that with suspicion, because you can twist the book of Revelation into it. 99 different permutations and 99 different meanings. Jesus didn't speak only about the return. He spoke about forgiveness. He spoke about grace. He spoke about mercy. Um, in this way, Jesus provides for us a, a means of understanding uh, who are the true and the false. In speaking about Jesus, uh, he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 20, by their fruit, you will know them. All I have to do is look through to Bill Moore's life to know, is he a follower of Jesus or is he a follower of himself? If he's promoting himself, probably a follower of self. If he's promoting Jesus, probably a follower of Jesus. If he's treating others with grace and mercy that he himself has received from God. That's another key indicator. And not saying to, uh, you know, not saying to me, you need to stay at least arm's length from me and take off your shoes when you approach me because the ground you're standing on here is holy ground. Um, if he starts saying that, I'm going to run away because the lightning is coming. We haven't even made it into verse seven. Uh, oh yeah, we have because we're in verse eight. Never mind. And and he speaks about don't lose don't lose heart in time of disaster. Uh, don't lose heart in catastrophes happen. Chapter thirteen, verses one to five. The Tower of Siloam that fell on on people. Jesus says the lesson you need to learn from that is repent because you too will likewise perish or repent lest you too likewise perish. Don't panic over these things. These things are going to happen. Nation is going to rise against nation, he says in verse 10, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places. Interestingly, you see all of these elements fulfilled in the book of Acts. There are earthquakes recorded in the book of Acts. There's a famine predicted. Um, there are people who are delivered up and in, in, in put in chains. There are people who uh, testify before kings and governors. All of these elements you find, if you read the greater context into the, into the book of Acts, all of these things happen. And Jesus says, before these things, before all of this, this is what's going to happen. These persecutions, these things that you're going to suffer. So the end isn't coming. Just because you're suffering persecution doesn't mean that the end is nigh. It could be that this is what God has purposed um, for you in your life. And so when he says in uh, verse... Do, 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 verse 9, do not be terrified. Terror is not an appropriate response to the tumults and the, and the chaos of life. God tells us through his word consistently, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, don't be afraid. I am with you even to the end of the age. No matter how chaotic things seem, we have to understand that God has already foreseen these things and he's already worked them into and embraced them within his divine purpose. When you see the army, though, when you see... Uh, the army surrounding Jerusalem, 
know, know then that the end is near. But before that, he says, not a hair of your head is going to fall to the earth. Not a hair of your head will perish. You might die, though. How do you justify those? How do you harmonize those two statements? If Christie suffers martyrdom because of her faith in Jesus, her physical body may perish. But her physical body perishing does not separate her from her eternal reward, does not separate her from the love she has in Christ Jesus through the Father. Paul tells us that at the end of Romans chapter 8. Her eternal destiny is assured. None of that perishes. She doesn't lose any of that. And I really like what he says in verse uh, 13 and 14, when you're brought before the kings and, and, the, and the leaders, this is your opportunity to bear witness. And then he says, don't prepare a speech beforehand because I'm going to give you the words you're going to speak. I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. The message is going to be the message of Christ. If Bill Moore is hauled before the governor of New, of New York State uh, to give testimony, it's not Bill Moore's message. It's the message of Christ. Bill is not promoting himself. He's not speaking in order to preserve his life. Jesus has already said earlier in, in chapter 14, unless you hate your life, you cannot be my disciple. If Bill tries to preserve his life and cowers back from the message, then Jesus says he's not worthy to be following me. The, when Jerusalem falls, there's going to be terror. There's going to be disaster. Uh, Jesus warns the disciples that the he speaks elsewhere saying that the sparrows are watched by God. They still fall to the earth. The book of Acts shows us Stephen is stoned. Um, Peter and John are set free in Acts chapter 4. James, the brother of Jesus, is slain by Herod in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Peter, who is also arrested by Herod to be put to death, escapes that same fate. Some are slain. Some are set free. Uh, Paul experiences disaster after disaster. Whether the outcome of persecution is life or death, we have spiritual protection. And we have the promise of ultimate deliverance. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 to 5. And Jesus says that by your endurance, by your enduring these things, you will preserve your life. It's not a, it's not a passive or placid um, exercise of patience. Uh, Peter Archibald isn't baptized and then sits back in his barco lounger and says, okay, I'm going to take it easy now and just wait for God to come and get me. He's called us to a life of service. Uh, he's called us even to a, a, a to challenging things and, and difficult things that may come our way. Um, but he says, by endurance, you're going to gain your lives. But, and here's Jesus answering the question, finally, that, the, that was asked up in verse 7. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation has come near. For the Jewish mind in the first century, the fall of Jerusalem was an in, in, inconceivable thought. Inconceivable. Uh, name that movie. Uh, the idea that Jerusalem could ever fall just did not compute in the mind of the in in the mind of the first century Jews. He says, "Then let those who are in Judea flee." Eusebius, the church historian, uh, writing three hundred and fifty-ish years after these events, uh, rites of this time. Uh, but the people in the Church of Jerusalem have, have been commanded by a revelation vouchsafed to approved men there before the war to leave the city and to dwell in a certain town of Perea called Pella. 
And when those that believed in Christ had come thither from Jerusalem, then as if the royal city of Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who had committed such outrages against Christ and his apostles and totally destroyed that generation of impious men. The Jewish church, uh, the, the church within Jerusalem is given the opportunity to... Um, <laughs> I just read your message, Christy. <laughs> um, they were given an opportunity to flee because Emperor Vespasian surrounded the city and Nero died. And suddenly there was turmoil in Rome. And so Vespasian left, left the, left the army there on the battlefield, quit the field, and went to Rome to be crowned emperor, uh, during which time there's uh, three other guys who are standing up saying, hey, I'm the emperor, and here comes Vespasian to put them down. He leaves his son Titus, the general, in charge of the army there, but there's that pause. And the, I don't know how many months it was, there's this pause. The army's there, but they're not attacking. And anyone who wants to leave the city can leave the city. And so the, the, the first century church in Jerusalem leaves the city, at least according to Eusebius. They flee following what Jesus says here, saying in verse 21, let those who are in Judea flee, flee to the mountains, uh, and let those who are in the side of the city depart. There's an opportunity given for the, uh, for the righteous there to escape. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. The Old Testament is filled with um, promises of punishment for disobedience. Disobedience of the law, and up to and including exile and, de and death by a sword, famine, and plague. Uh, you, you can find numerous uh, references to God punishing the disobedience of the people when they had gone after idols, how much more deserving of punishment are they when they execute his Christ? They reject Jesus, put him to death as a criminal and refuse to accept him as Messiah. Because the age of the law, because the age of the Jew of Judaism is coming to an end, and God is going to execute justice and vengeance against the city that put his son to death. And Josephus, who uh, one writer says is given to exaggeration of numbers, and he is, says that the number of Jews who died when the Romans raised Jerusalem was 1,100,000. He says that another 97,000 were taken captive to be displayed in Rome and then sent off as slaves in various provinces and to the Egyptian mines. And that's, that's cited several times within uh, the writings uh, in Jewish wars. He paints an horrific description of this, the streets running with blood because so many people died. Uh, and then he acquits the general Titus uh, by having him say that Titus had offered time and again, it offered terms of peace, but the Jews wouldn't have it. They fought to the last man, they fought to the death, confident that God was going to give them deliverance when God had already decreed through the words of Jesus that the city was going to fall and be destroyed. And so Jesus says that... Uh, uh, they will fall by the sword, by the edge of the sword, and be led captive among all nations. And Josephus uh, refers to that. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that's a confusing phrase. And I'm not certain I have the right of it, but I think we have at least a dual reference here. It relates, obviously, to the role of the Gentiles as God's agents in the prophecy here of the destruction and subsequent uh, occupation of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has been occupied by Gentiles ever since to this day. 
Uh, there's still there's still Gentiles living in Jerusalem, but more specifically, I think he's referring to the proclamation of the good news to the Gentiles, the message of the gospel going to the Gentile people and the Gentiles embracing the gospel. And when that time is up, something else is going to happen. And I think that something else is the return of Christ. That the message to the, the time of the Gentiles is going to go however long it goes. And then when God, when the time has come that God decrees that it, it's uh, as determined by the Father, Jesus will return. Because the church, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 to 27, I just got done telling you, don't listen to people who uh, base their theology on Revelation, but I think this is an accurate interpretation. He speaks of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It's not heaven. He's speaking to the church. We are the new Jerusalem. Not a city, a physical city with a, with a physical geographic location. But Chad and Christy in their home, they're the church. Bill in your home, you are the church. Peter and Shannon in your home, you are the church. We are the new Jerusalem. Individually, collectively, a city made holy. Not because of anything that Chad or Christy or Shannon or Peter or Bill or myself or anybody else has done. Not because where we walk is holy ground and flowers spring up in our footsteps but because God has made us that way through the blood of Jesus. There's a lot of blood shed in Jerusalem. The blood of Jesus is the blood that cleanses us. When God executes judgment against the unfaithful Jews, he does it with a stroke of finality. And Judaism and temple worship has never again risen in the way that it was then in the first century. Quickly on the application, uh, I just wanna go over the don'ts here. Jesus, I think, gives us four don'ts to living faithfully in uncertain times. Don't be led astray. There are still people coming along with new messages and new words and different gospels and new teachings and watered down versions of the gospel to make it a little bit more palatable saying to 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 peter and shannon you've heard of the ten commandments well today we're giving you a discount we'll say six you guys keep six commandments and you're golden the other four you know and you can choose the four that you don't want to you don't want to be don't want to be fussed with don't be afraid Uncertain times cause a lot of fear. God is certain. God is sure. God is, we can trust in God. God is sovereign and he sees the end of all things. And I trust that the end that he sees works out for his glory. And if he can use me for his glory, then so be it. And if that means that I'm fed to the lions in the, uh, in the, uh, Colosseum in colony, which they don't have, then so be it. If I can be used to his glory by teaching, then so be it. Let me teach. Don't be afraid during uncertain times. Don't miss the opportunity to witness. Uh, I think that that's important. God gives us the opportunity, the time that we have to share our faith, to tell others about Jesus and the difference that he's made in our lives is now. I'm not guaranteed 40 years from now. In fact, it would probably be highly unlikely. And finally, don't give up. Is it easy to give up? I am a person who is easily frustrated with certain things anyway. Um, when things, and I'm the dummy that will try it again, the second, the second and the third and the fourth and the sixth time, the same way I did the first time when it didn't work and it frustrated me. And as I go, I keep getting more and more frustrated. So I, I'm, it's easy for me to say, I want to give up. But Jesus didn't give up. He went to the cross he went into Jerusalem knowing that he was going to be rejected, 
knowing that he was going to be betrayed, knowing that he was going to be falsely tried and then hung on a Roman cross and die. He didn't give up. And if he can endure all of that, nobody has ever dragged me before, uh, before a howling mob demanding my death because of my faith. I'm not putting a qualifier on that. I haven't been dragged before any other mobs either for any other reason. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's how we, that's how we walk faithfully. Next week, Labor Day, no class. And I'm not just doing that to get out of teaching class, but um, it's the Labor Day weekend, and I know some people have plans. September 13th, we will get into the second coming, uh, and then through the 4th of October, this is the way I think we're going to go. It's a shame that Christy isn't here to see the title of September 27th lesson. We've got two swords uh, because she wrote in, in there earlier in the comments, uh, put, Peter, put away your sword. Um, this is how I see the lessons going, subject to change, of course, uh, without notice. Let me stop the share and stop the recording.